Oh, you can light it, bro. Light it, light it. You can light it, light it. Fucking light it. Bro, pick it up. Green. <laughs> so if you don't know what that is, that's actually... Well, go back and listen to episode three. That was uh, one, of the, one of the videos from Pat the Bat, Violence as a Service, our, our episode where Pat the Bat was um, uh, attempting to fire mom somebody's house. So, yeah, it's one of our favorite things now. So we're just going to have to open with it and, until you listen to episode three because Seth and I crack jokes about this all the time. All right, so, hey, Seth, we got a brand new case today, and I tried to completely shift gears in many, many different ways. So, are you ready for this? I am ready. Sweet. So, let me start out and talk about our case details. We're going to, this is going to be a quicker case. Um, hopefully, it's not going to be a ton of stuff you have to remember like our previous cases. Um, this is, for me, it was a, a lot of fun to research this one because... The technology in this one is just personally identifiable information. So things like social security numbers and birth dates and so forth. Yeah, there's a defined list. Uh, it's pretty extensive. It keeps growing if you guys go Google that. But the idea with PII is that with the right combination of it, you can identify a specific person. Right. So it could be a home address. It could be some medical information. Uh, it could be you know your social security number, your bank account information. Um, and so, you know, that, uh, will definitely be the key element here in this, uh, in this episode. Yeah. It's because, well, in this crime, they steal this identifiable information. So that's one of the crimes. And then one of the other crimes is they use that information to, uh, file false IRS, like false tax returns. Right. Which falls into the ID theft, uh, world of criminal activity. Yeah. Hey, Seth, do you want to tell us briefly about our criminals? Uh, well, so everyone has heard of, uh, hopefully, the, the Florida Man game. Well, um, and, you know, if you've been listening to our prior podcast, and statistically speaking, young men have really been the only perpetrators of the cyber crimes that we've looked at so far. This week, we're seeing the ladies get in on the action. So in this instance, we had three uh, Florida-based women I don't know if Florida woman has taken over, uh, such as Florida man, but that's uh, where we are here. Yeah. All right. So their victims end up being, and this is who we know. We just know about hundreds of U.S. citizens. And <clears throat> the reason why I say U.S. citizens is because it's U.S.-based tax returns that are filed. The clinchers here are, uh, A, how do you not become a victim? We'll talk about that in a bit. And then uh, this is kind of an unknown, unfortunately, is how did the criminals get access to the PII? And we'll talk about the type of PII they had access to. But the fact is, uh, the documents that we reviewed to uh, produce this, uh, uh, this episode, we don't know. Uh, it's very likely, though, inside information or something was purchased off of likely the dark web. But uh, if we get that information at a later point, we'll certainly update you, everybody. Yeah, absolutely. And I was thinking about, um, we'll have some off weeks here and there where we do research and we'll have like little updates and, um, uh, more of the traditional bite sense, meaning smaller bites of news that we can put in. And this would be, uh, one of them that would be great to update. So with that, please sit back and enjoy episode six of e-crime bites. <laughs> Oh, Seth. Hey, I was just checking our stats and plug walk. Joe is the number one. I'm sorry. Number two, most downloaded in the first week on track to be the number one most downloaded in the first week. And I just wanted to say thanks for downloading and listening to our newest episodes. And we hope to um, keep bringing you interesting information like that in our true crime stories and, and make it entertaining add a little bit of humor and also teach you a little bit about computers. So do be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast app to hear about our latest episodes, which um, if we stay on schedule is going to be Wednesday mornings. 
Another update. I know you are all really curious about how Tall Flamingo is doing. And I just want to let you know, she was happy with our episodes, our prior episodes. So much so, she left us an Apple podcast review. And it was awesome. And she just said, very interesting content. Looking forward to the upcoming episodes. Great job, guys. And if you wonder who Tall Flamingo is because you skipped some episodes, you're going to have to go back to episode five where I introduce you to who Tall Flamingo is. And I just thought, um, I had an idea, Seth, that if someone makes a uh, humorous Apple podcast review, that we'll pick our favorites and read them at the beginning of some of these podcasts. What do you think about that, Seth? I love it. So please, for our, our listeners, bring it on. Yeah, so I'll be checking the Apple podcast reviews and. I'll be picking out the ones that are favorites and we'll try to read them on here. So with that, let's switch gears and go on to our case. Now, a little bit of this, well, I'll even say a lot of this is going to be repetitive, but I'm going to have to be repetitive in order to get some points across for later on when the investigators are putting things together. So with that, I want to introduce you to our first of the three ladies that we talked about. And this, this almost sounds like it's straight out of a, a movie. Her name is Starling Willis. So we're talking June 5th, 2009. Starling Willis opened a Publix credit union account. I'm going to read the number here once just in case it's important again, but don't, don't get fixated on these numbers. 2749-4500. So I'll just say 4500 from now on. Now, does everybody know what Publix is? Because I think not everybody is familiar with Publix. So for those of you who are Florida-based, I'm sure you know it. I only know it because I have family down in Florida. Publix is like this fantastic, huge grocery store um, that does a lot of different things, right? In some regards, it's similar to Walmart, I guess. Uh, you know, There's banking available. There's coffee there. Uh, obviously, it's a full-service grocery store. You buy cakes there. Um, so it is uh, fairly ubiquitous down in South Florida. So it's not shocking that people would open an account uh, down there. People can cash checks there. That, that's another service they offer. It's fairly uh, extensive. Not being a Florida man myself, I'm glad you told me that. I didn't know that was a, more of a Florida thing. That makes sense. Awesome. Hey, I wanted to show you um, these pictures will be on the, our podcast website. Uh, if you wanted to see them, because sometimes they don't translate over once you start seeing them in your phone. So yeah. if I talk about Does, photos and things, you might want to go to our website with, um, you know, like a web yeah, browser. Sometimes, and it's interesting because it brings some context to the names here, right? So here is a very pretty lady, I would say, darling, pretty eyes. Does not look like somebody who commits crimes. Uh, although here, I would argue she might have been a victim in some regards as well. Yeah. You know, we did not set this up. And when I was looking at this, I was thinking, this this woman is very, very pretty. And immediately I thought, she would not target me. So you know, maybe she's one of the better criminals, right? Because she's unsuspecting. Wait until you meet our other criminals. All right. So let's get back to what she did. So on June 5th, 2009, she opened a public credit account. So it's just like, think of it like a... Uh, yeah, so Publix a, has a separate arm that offers also a credit union, which is you know very similar to a bank. They offer finance. They offer loans. Like I said, they'll cash checks for you. Um, I think it's probably a separate building than the grocery store, but I think it's all part of. I know it's all part of the same larger Publix um, conglomerate. Yeah, and so just think of it as a bank account because there's going to be other bank accounts here. Um, we'll say we'll say Publix from now on. Just to, we're not going to say Credit Union and all that stuff uh, because we're going to have some other bank names that are familiar that are coming up too. So, so this is 2009. Now, I try to write these podcasts so that they're as chronological as much as possible, but here in this episode, we're going to have to bounce around a little bit just to kind of make some sense of the crime. So, 2009, she opens the account. Fast forward, 2011. So, September 2011, the IRS received a 2010, so the prior year's tax return, in the name of Shavon, and the last name starts with P, 
and it's a $1,296 refund payable to this account, this Publix account that we're talking about. So what does the government do? They get an, something they think is probably valid. They pay it. So the amount of $1,296 was deposited October 7th, 2011, which is uh, roughly two weeks-ish after it was filed. Okay, so that was an interesting event. And you would say, that's strange because it's a different person's name going into Starling Willis's, Starling Willis's account. But all right, let's fast forward to five days after that deposit. We have another IRS tax return they received for 2010. In a different person's name, this person's name is Dexter. It's a two. Th- oh, I'm sorry, a one thousand two hundred fifty-six dollar refund payable to this same Publix account. Uh, roughly nine days afterwards, that amount was deposited. And let it be noted that the law enforcement interview which took place a couple of years later uh, with Dexter S said he didn't give anybody permission to file in his name. So there's your first indication of identity theft. Yeah. So now we know it's a crime because Dexter said it was not him. But again, we're bouncing around chronologically. This is, they know this a couple of years later now. So we're now still back in 2011. It's October 19th and the IRS receives another return. This is from Daquan. It's 1,265. So we're about the same amount of dollars. Right. IRS takes that, deposits deposits it about nine days later. And I'm going to wrap up um, two more on February of 2012. Two different people's name. There's a Trayvon and Daquan. Oh, Daquan is actually used twice. Right. Um, So that's interesting, right? So we have, we fast forward from October of 2011 to February of 2012, right? So about four or five months. And you had an additional tax return and a very similar amount, 1277 to a new name, a Trayvon. But then the same day, February 4th, 2012, as a Trayvon was another Dequan uh, refund in a very eerily similar number here, 1268. And it's, um, it, it just immediately struck me while I was going through these with, with Mr. Jones here, excuse me, Dr. Jones, <laughs> that um, these numbers are eerily similar. And I'm disappointed, but frankly not surprised that no flags were raised, that you have four or five different names uh, of totally different people who are not associated with that public credit union account having tax return income, uh, you know, dedicated to that account or, or deposited rather to that account. But I also assume that the IRS is pretty busy, and doesn't have the bandwidth, certainly now, let alone a dozen years ago, to go through and, you know, make those connections, at least not without other indications of a crime. Yeah. So, and- so Starling continued here, right? So flash, flash forward a little bit after February to April of 2012, and uh, the IRS received another tax return, this time in the name of a Nick F for $1,274, also payable to the public's account. That was deposited in May uh, of 2012. Same date, April 14th, 2012, another return, this one in the name of a gentleman named Larry B., Maybe Larry Bird, my favorite player. Uh, a little bit uh, more money here, $1,668. Now, this was not paid by the IRS, but we don't know why. And then the day after, uh, April 15th, 2012, technically tax day, um, an IRS, the IRS rather received a 2011 tax return in the name of a Leonard P., this time in a slightly higher amount, 1867 refund payable to this account. That one was deposited at the end of April 30th, 2012. So a couple of the, the single anomaly here was that one of those returns for 1668 uh, for Larry was not paid by the IRS, but we don't know why. Yeah. So if we kind of reverse at this point, so now we go back to 2010. Starling Willis opens another account. She opens an account as SunTrust, and which is a Florida, one, a large Florida-based bank. And this one ends in 7266. So we're talking January 20th, 2011. You see a, another return for Chantrill. Now this one is $5,022. And then the IRS, it deposited 
uh, that five thousand dollars on January twenty eighth. So eight days later, they paid out over five thousand dollars. Same year, so we're talking two thousand eleven to September twenty fourth. IRS got a return from Javaris, and it was one thousand two hundred. So we're back in the original dollar range, and right, it was that payable to this account. Was a uh, anomaly. Yep, and this was deposited by the IRS October seventh. So five days later. Uh, another tax return comes in from a Larisha, and it's $1,297. IRS then deposits that. Now, later on in 2013, the law enforcement, they went through and did the interviews of the victims, and they noted that Larisha said she does not know who Willis is and did not give anyone permission to file her 2011 tax return. I guess I want to make a quick um, correction. SunTrust is not based out of Florida. They're based out of Georgia. I know they're a Southern bank, but they are Georgia based, not Florida. My apologies. Gotcha. Yeah. And I'll make, I'll make a correction. What I just said, it would actually be her 2010 return in 2011 timeframe that it was filed. So then the next year in 2012, the IRS receives another tax return from a person named Jalissa for two thousand. I'm sorry, $1,204, and the IRS then paid that one out a couple weeks later. So Willis continued a couple more. Uh, also in February of 2012, the IRS received a 2011 tax return in the name of a Chantrill L, this time for a slightly lower amount of $1,153, and that was deposited at the end of that month in 2012. And then April 1st, 2012, so in the spring, the IRS received yet another 2011 tax return in the name of a Robert J. This was a fairly hefty amount of over $4,000, um, but only a partial refund was deposited of $968. We don't know why that $4,000 was cut down to 968 but it was. Yeah, that's strange. If I had to guess, I wonder if that person owed money and they were like, Oh, we're going to take what you owe us and then give you just the remainder back or something something strange like that that we're just Yeah, I mean, I have here. to take a look at the return to figure it out. It depends on it. Maybe they filed incorrectly or there was additional income tax that, you know, um, they were subject to or additional income. Uh, you know, there's all kinds of reasons why that wouldn't be fully paid. But, you know, if you're a fraudster, who cares? It's all free money. Starling opened up another account at a different bank, this one at Wells Fargo, which is a fairly prominent national bank. So this was an account ending in the uh, 93T, excuse me, 9322. Uh, we know in early January of 2012, the IRS received a 2011 tax return in the name of a Kimberly B for $7,249 payable. Now that one was only uh, partially deposited of $2,200, but that's the that's largest amount jump. I think we've seen. Yeah, yeah I was going to say that's a big $7, jump. Now, law enforcement in their interview back, uh, later on in 2013, uh, in an interview with Miss Kimberly B, again, she did not know Willis and did not give anyone permission to file her tax return. So that's now three instances across three banks where we definitely have some identity theft and identity fraud. So fast flash forward in February of 2012, the IRS received another 2011 tax return in the name of a Ronisha M for a similar number of $1,288. We've seen that before. This one also was not paid. We don't know why. Several of these were not paid. Uh, flash forward a little bit later, at the end of March of 2012, the IRS received a 2011 tax return in the name of a Roger S. This one for a slightly higher than typical for this set of transactions amount of $3,900, also not paid. In April 14th, 2012, a 2011 tax return was filed in the name of a Wendell J for $1,600. That one was deposited. And April 14th, same day as the prior one, a 2011 tax return in the name of Anita P for $1,245. We've seen a number very, very similar to that. That was also deposited at the end of April of 2012. Do we have any more on Wells Fargo, Mr. Jones? No, we have a Chase Bank account now, and I'll take this one. This is 94. Let's go to Chase. Yep, this one ends in 9450. And I'm just going to summarize this one because you're probably getting bored of hearing names. Very, very and, similar fact pattern. Numbers. Here. So we got one, two, three, four, 
five transfers, or I'm sorry, five different IRS tax returns that were filed. Um, one of they range from four thousand dollars to just over a thousand dollars. Um, the law enforcement did interview one of the victims. It was the four thousand dollar victim, and they said they did not know Willis and did not give anyone permission to file his tax return. And it looks like about half of them were paid, and then near the end, um, 2012 ish, 2013. They started um, coming back as not paid. So what does Willis do? Do you think she stopped? Heck no. No, she went to a bank I never heard of called Region Bank. Yep. This one ends in 7920. So I will quickly summarize this one as right, well. Same we, have, we have one, two, three, four, five different IRS tax returns. Law enforcement talked to one person and they said, well, at least one person. And they said, um, did not authorize anyone to file their tax returns. The money number or the numbers range from 1,600 down to 1,100. So in the thousand dollar range here. So now we have a pause ish because I know we were out of chronological order, but well, let's recap. Imagine. So we know Starling Willis had opened up three, four different bank accounts, right? Publix, regional, Wells Fargo, Wells Fargo, and Chase had made you know five to seven or five to ten deposits of tax refund money and filed tax returns in other people's names. And it sounds like seventy or eighty percent of them were paid, and a handful of them were not paid. So, ranging from about a thousand to what was the top? Like I think the high was seven thousand, but that one 7, only uh, a small amount of it was paid. So yeah. now we're a year later. So now we're like in the two thousand ten range. So we're gonna meet the second lady of this group, second Florida woman. Yes, she is. Her name is Latanya Verdell, and I've got a picture of her here for you, Seth. And remember how we had. Starling Willis up front, who sounds like she comes, you know, from a, a movie. Her name is just sounds awesome. Well, Riddell, on the other hand, she looks like she would target you. She looks like yeah. she would seek you out. I mean, I'm not making fun <laughs> of anybody. This picture reminds me of, remember, there's an old picture of um, Nick Nolte, who was arrested, and his hair was in five different directions, and he looked like he was just picked up off the street after having spent considerable time on it. This kind of reminds me of that. Uh, it's not a flattering picture. It's um, it's a tough shot. No, and you know, with with her eyes, she could possibly stab you too. I, I'd imagine. Yeah, definitely um, a different visage compared to uh, Starling. So why why did she become involved here? Well, there was a search warrant that was executed at Verdell's house, and we don't exactly know why there was a search warrant, but I imagine somebody somewhere. Told on name her. Named names. Somebody <laughs> yeah, named told names. On her. And right. that's that's how it got to this point. So this is in Green Acres, Florida. And when they performed the the when law enforcement performed the search warrant, there were many documents related to ID theft. So you had tax returns. <laughs> Big surprise. That's what our whole episode's about. You had driver's licenses. You had uh, social security cards, bank statements, debit cards. And then you had logbooks of names, date of births, and social security numbers. So all those things that I just mentioned, when I say personally identifiable information in these episodes, that's all personally identifiable information or PII is. Yeah, and these are not way. PII adjacent. This is like the heart of PII, right? <laughs> exactly. You can't get any more personally identifiable than information you're going to find on somebody's tax returns, driver's license, their social security card, bank statements, debit cards, uh, and then in a logbook, names, DOBs, date of birth, dates of birth, and social security numbers. Remember I said individually, an individual PII um, bit of PII rather, may not be telling. But when you start combining things, that's when it can become specifically dangerous. Yeah, you want to tell us about the search warrant results? Sure. So the Verdell search warrant results were uh, fairly aggressive. There were over 800 names 
with ID information. There was paper with handwritten bank account info, including routing numbers and account info. So anyone who's done any kind of banking knows that in order to make a deposit, right, you have to have a bank account and you have to have a routing number for said bank account. So they had that for the five different um, entities, not four that I mentioned earlier, you have Wells Fargo, SunTrust, the Publix Credit Union, Chase Bank, and Regents Bank. Now, all those accounts belong to Starling Willis. Which is not Verdell, which is where the search warrant Right, happened. so there's your connection. There's your co-conspirator uh, connection there. All right, so I want to tell you now <laughs> about an interview that Willis has with law enforcement. Now, you got to go with me on this. This is what, according to Willis, Starling Willis, this is what she said is going on when she talked to law enforcement on October 4th, 2013. So here she goes. She says, I know about the deposits in all these accounts, but they were, and this is straight out of court paperwork, quote unquote, payday loans and not tax refunds. So immediately I'm kind of scratching my head going, okay, um, I'll try to follow this. And now she continues on and says, I received these payday loans through my friend, LaTanya Verdell. So, <laughs> yeah, if that's not already weird. So she also says, Verdell was an acquaintance that could obtain large payday loans for other people. This just, does this not sound fishy as shit just from the beginning, Seth? Well, I mean, you get a tax refund, you know, usually the receipt on that comes from either the federal government or the state. It's one or the other, right? So a payday loan, you know, would come from whoever the payday lender would be, and it wouldn't be the government. So that alone is kind of confusing to me. Um, I'm aware of payday loans, and I'm sure that, you know, there are people who can obtain payday loans for other people, but uh, I'm not understanding that connection. Um, but more importantly, you know, Starling said that in exchange for the payday loan, she had to give Verdell half in cash. I don't know how that's remotely legal, let alone ethical or moral. Uh, she claimed that she got the loans, that the lenders would withdraw the loan payments from her account. However, Starling could not point to any loan payments on her bank statements. So she's making statements here that are clearly factually incorrect. Yeah, and there were, um, she, say, she said there were only about eight payday loans through Verdell, and there were um, at least 21 tax returns that she received. All right, so let's fast forward to May 11th, 2015. So law enforcement, a lot of times they don't just interview you once, they'll interview you several times and see if your story changes. So it's a couple of years, what is it? A couple of years later? Let me double check. Right, so the yep, first interview was in 2013. End of so, 2013, so now we're in the yeah, middle of 2015. So now we're in 2015 and it's the second Willis interview and they bring her in and they basically were going to interview her and immediately she just says, all right, all that prior stuff I told you, that was all bullshit. Here's the real story. She said, um, Verdell went to Willis's mother's home and asked if she wanted to make some money. So how many great conversations do you have with your friends that start out with, hey, you want to make some money? Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. It, it doesn't really pass the smell test. Um, so she said that um, she Verdell, being Verdell. No, no, no. Uh, Willis said that Verdell told Willis that Verdell and her partner, which is, is the third person, Kelly McIntosh. All right. So Kelly McIntosh being our third Florida, Florida man, Florida woman. Yep. So Kelly McIntosh and Verdell, apparently it sounds like they've been running the scam for a while. And so they told Willis, and Willis is telling the law enforcement this, that they had bank accounts, but they couldn't receive any more tax refunds. So if someone comes to you up, up to you at your mother's house and says, hey, you want to make some money? And then says, I can't make any more money. I'm going to need you to make me some money. Immediately, immediately, that should be some red flag. That should be a pretty heavy duty red flag. Yeah. Yeah, so then Verdell offered to Willis a chance to make some money by accepting the refunds that they can no longer do accept, accept anymore in their accounts. 
And Verdell then told Willis to open more bank accounts. So it sounds like Verdell is the mastermind out of the three yep. Florida women posse here. That's why I mentioned earlier that um, Starling Willis uh, sounds like a little bit of a victim here. So then Willis gave Verdell her ATM cards and bank info because she basically set them up for the group. And when they do their scams with the um, tax returns, um, Willis being the mastermind, I guess, would go pull the money out. So in, in continuing in this interview, um, Willis then said that Verdell would then drive her, Willis, to the various banks, the five different banks that we talked about, and Willis would go in and withdraw the refund money and then come back out and give Verdell the cash. So in exchange for giving Verdell the cash for the tax refunds, Willis would get a cut. I, and I'm thinking about this, and I'm like, it sounds like Willis is doing almost all the legwork taking almost all the risk and then Verdell gets most of the money. Yeah. So, and that's the key thing is not just the amount of work and a little bit of money, but pretty much all the risk uh, considerably, but we'll see how that pans out um, at the end of the day on this. So the victims were listed in Verdell's residence. All the victims of Willis, that's Starling Willis, were listed in documentation the authority sees in executing the Verdell search warrant back in June of 2013. So now let's flash forward to May 14th of 2015, the indictment. And so, you know, and Keith brings up a good point later. This is a good example of, you know, these things take time, right? You're now two or three years in uh, just on the investigation. And, you know, remember this whole case started in 2009 with the opening of these bank accounts. So it's taken now almost six years just to get to this point. Yeah, and I'll quickly go over these counts for you. So the indictment. Um, the first one that came out was for Latanya Verdell and Kelly McIntosh. Verdell had a Cobra, a, I'm sorry, a Cobra Enterprises 38 special handgun during the crime. So boom, count one. That's count one right there is having a, a gun during this crime. Yeah, and I wanted to comment on that because I think we've seen this before. Uh, and I want to make this very clear. And I thought this was an interesting tidbit. The 38 caliber handgun that was owned by Verdell during the crime. So. The key point here is generally having a gun while committing a crime can and often does severely increase the severity of a crime. And here, we don't know which specific criminal act was associated with the gun ownership. And obviously, it was a legal ploy here to ratchet up the indictment. But either way, it's a good notion to remember that having a gun and being involved in any criminal activity is a toxic mix. Yeah, and a lot of electronic crime that we're going to be um, bringing to you, a lot of it's just, quote-unquote, a gentleman's crime, meaning there's not a lot of guns and violence involved. It, I'm showing you a lot of violence cases because they're interesting to talk about. Right, they're more uh, but the exception than the rule, right. But there's a lot of electronic crime out there, and we're going to get to it where it's theft of, just theft of money, and it has money online and it has nothing to do, you know, there's no reason for guns and bats, pat the bats and all that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, if you're going to commit computer crime, don't have a gun is what that says. So the second count is Verdell had access devices. And I was like, what does this mean? And I looked up in the court paperwork and that means ATM cards. Okay. That's the second count. So then we have counts three through six, which is both Verdell and Macintosh. And that was for committing wire fraud. And I imagine that was for um, probably a handful of victims. Now, um, counts 7 through 9 and 13 through 15 was just Verdell. I'm sorry. Let me back up. It was Verdell and McIntosh for theft of public money, counts 7 through 9. Now, there was a second set of counts for just Verdell. 13 through 15 in theft of public money. So Verdell's getting a lot more of the counts associated with her than uh, McIntosh was. Counts 10 through 12 were both Verdell and McIntosh. That was aggravated identity theft. And then Verdell had a false statement, which was count 16. Um, and <laughs> this well, was, that interesting. was interesting, right? Because that ties yeah. to the SNAP program, also known as a Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, which is really like, you know, a program designed to help, you know, people who are financially strapped, you know, to basically feed them. It's really the old food stamps program. 
So to uh, she claimed she only made seven hundred and thirteen dollars per month. So this was basically the prosecutors kind of throwing shit at the wall to see what they could get to stick on her because that sounds like it's a completely separate uh, crime here. Basically, she clearly, in other words, by notion of her crime, she was taking in a lot more money and income, but was only reporting the snap payments that she had received of seven hundred dollars a month. So I found that to be a fairly interesting uh, additional um, part of the indictment. Yep. And she also, or they attributed at least 790 people's PII or the person identifiable information with, um, with, with these two individuals, uh, Verdell and McIntosh in this indictment. So the other thing I thought was interesting, Keith is, you know, they teach you in law school to kind of break down a fact pattern, right? You know, and, and associate elements of what crimes may be broken with those fact patterns. So here, you know, if you break down their scheme, it's, you know, fairly simple, right? There are kind of three elements, right? They had a bunch of PII and they went ahead and, you know, filed tax returns upon other people's names and then collected that money. And if you break down, that ended up, you know, equaling what, 16 or 17 counts of different criminal acts. And it's just very interesting how, you know, what seemed like a fairly simple scheme, you know, really gets broken down into a very complex uh, legal uh miasma of of uh of crime yeah you're gonna make me look up that word now or that word now aren't you seth miasma that's a good one that's the first time i've ever heard that all right so now we jump to june 10th 2015 starling willis is charged so when we were talking about that indictment we were talking about just verdell and mcintosh and now willis which is the almost victim and you know she was kind of victimized i guess in, in a way from the other two women um, so she was the third that got charged, and this is June 10th, 2015. So we know, yeah, in June of 2015, Starling Willis is now formally charged in Palm Beach um, for, you know, a specific set of offenses here, right? For here, there was theft of public money and aggravated uh, identity theft. Yeah, and if we then go about a month later, so it's October 8th, 2015, Verdell pleads guilty. So the count she pleads guilty to, do you want to go through them, Seth? Sure. So one was firearm, right? She was a convicted felon previously. We did not know that until recently. Uh, but she did have that thirty eight caliber uh, in her bedroom, and the firearm was apparently stolen. There was access to devices. So there was at least 500 social security numbers, credit debit cards with account numbers. The third count was wire fraud. And then she also got... Uh, Three additional counts, uh, aggravated identity theft, the theft of public money, and then the false statement about SNAP. Um, and that totaled around $1,251 too. Yeah, and so the next day, the very next day, Willis then pleads guilty. And she pleads to the first count is wire fraud, and the second count is aggravated identity theft. And then, what, a couple days after that, five days after that? McIntosh pled guilty as well, also to a couple of counts on wire fraud and also aggravated identity theft. Yeah, so that was, uh, let's see, late 2015. We're talking October 2015. And so now if we move to January 2016, the very first sentencing is Verdell. And Verdell got 94 months in prison, which when you do the math is about eight years, and she will have three years of supervised release after that. And then they yeah. So let's go through the criminal monetary mo, excuse me criminal monetary penalties here because it's very interesting. So the defendant must pay the total criminal monetary penalties under schedule of payments here. Uh, there's three items here. There was an assessment of six hundred dollars, which you're like, okay, that's not so bad, right? And then there's a fine of zero dollars. You're like, okay, that's kind of weird. But then there's restitution in the amount of nine hundred and forty-seven thousand dollars. Two hundred well, nine hundred and forty seven thousand two hundred and ninety six dollars and eighty one cents. So almost nine hundred and fifty thousand dollars, basically a little less than a million dollars in restitution. So uh, and I'm not sure how a two time criminal is ever going to be able to make enough money to pay that back, by the way. But um, that's a significant, significant penalty. Yeah. And then um, the same day, Willis is sentenced. So she's sentenced for thirty three months in prison, which is just under three years. She will have three years of supervised release and going through the numbers like Seth just went through, her assessment was $200. Her fine was zero. 
and her restitution was about thirty-two and a half thousand dollars. Right, which we'll come back to that in a bit. Uh, that's an interesting number. And Macintosh, who got sentenced the following year, early in February, excuse me, early of 2016 in February, she also got about three years in prison, 36 months, um, but I think it was three years supervised release. And apparently she had a drug issue, so she was recommended for 500 of hours of drug treatment program while in prison. So her totals were also quite high. Her assessment was only 200 rather than 600, no fine, but her restitution was over $755,000. Yeah. Now, the coda to this story was very interesting. Keith, you want to take this? Yeah, so let's see. We were talking about sentencing. This is um, February 2016. If we jump ahead three years now to December 10th, 2019, Willis's probation is revoked. Right. Now, keep in mind, we looked at Starling as like the least bad of the uh, triumvirate of the Florida ladies here. Um, but her probation was revoked. We don't know why, other than the fact that it was. I was going to say, I tried to look um, for the reason, and I couldn't find it readily in the court paperwork, Uh, but I just know that it was revoked. And then I also saw a note on there that she's ordered to pay $250 per month towards restitution. And I don't know if that's a cause and effect thing that she, you know, her probation was revoked because she's not paying and now she has to pay, or if it's a completely independent issue of her paying, it didn't really say, but. Yeah, and my back of the napkin math says that if she pays $250 a month to pay back $32,000, and again, it's, I understand it's a couple of years after she's pled, that's going to take her 128 months to pay that back. That is a very long time to have to uh, make a payment on something. Yeah. Woo-wee. So we are done with the case now. So we are to our conclusion. And um, so when I'm thinking about this, when I went look back at this case, first of all, it was pretty crazy. It was very fast paced and the ladies did a lot of damage in a, I'll say a fairly short amount of time. I mean, over years, but they, they, they filed a lot of returns over those years. And so it did take a long time to crush, catch this crime. Um, if you count when they opened the accounts, it, you would say it started at 2009. If you say when the false return started happening, that would be around 2011. And it lasted for about a year or two. And they were brought to justice finally in 2015 to 2016 time frame. Yeah. Um, the other note we took on this is Willis, Starling Willis, took a lot of risk here and appears to have made the least amount of money from the crimes. However, if you recall the restitution amounts, um, the other two, Verdell and who was the third lady, uh, Keith? Uh, Willis, McIntosh, and Verdell. Yes. Verdell and McIntosh, who were the more of the masterminds, remember their payments were 950000 and 755000 respectively, versus 32000 for Starling. So... At least there was a small benefit for her taking the biggest amount of risk here for having the significantly lowest amount of restitution payment. So the old adage, crime doesn't pay, really does hold true here. Yeah, and my next thought about this case was, I it bothered me I did not know where their PII came from. I know as a computer security person, you know, this is my day job, and I know it's very, very easy to get. But the fact that they didn't say where this gang got it in their court paperwork bothered me because I, I just wanted to know. I wanted to know where they got it from today. Yeah, and don't forget, I mean, there's all kinds of breach notification laws, and anyone who pays attention to the news the last 20 years knows there's thousands of you know breaches from corporations you know where a lot of this information is now available. So we had two kind of sub-bullets on where this data could have come from. It could have been a data breach. It could have been an insider at a company. Um, although those things could have been, you know, simultaneous, right? It came from somewhere. It did come from a breach. Clearly it probably came from a company. And then the third bowl that's missing is it was probably purchased. And that's it could have been purchased, you know, on the dark web. My suspicion here is somebody had access and fed, um, Macintosh this information probably from a couple of years prior. And she was sitting on it until she concocted, you know, the scheme with Macintosh and, and uh, Willis to put it all together here. But I agree. That was frustrating to not know that. But the other key thing here is that the sentences are higher eight years uh, in this tax fraud case compared to some of our previous episodes. So as a 
point of reference um, in our first episode, the community of our um, cryptocurrency thieves, they got about four-ish years. The deadly swatting that revolted, sorry, resulted in someone's actual death, that person got five years. The Twitter hack involving a juvenile was three years. So here, I guess because real money was stolen, um, or maybe because the laws are more mature, the uh, consequences were quite a bit more significant. I th- maybe it's more people understand tax fraud a lot more than I think they understand electronic crime. And I, I notice <laughs> sentences on things where people can tangibly think about it tend to be a lot stronger. And when you say, oh, I stole some cryptocurrency to a lot of people, you know, if you just pick up somebody on the street, you might pick somebody that doesn't even know what cryptocurrency is, you know? For sure. Well, my, my last thought on this episode is that criminals are usually caught when the money trail is followed. So in every case that we've seen so far, there's been some choke point where the law enforcement is able to get their evidence in order to prosecute the people, the criminals doing their crime. And, um, you know, for as annoying as it is for us, normal people, (laughs) I use quote unquote there, normal people that don't do crime for us to put in PII information into bank accounts and Coinbase's and so forth, you know, for, from the law enforcement standpoint, it's, it's worth its weight in gold because we saw, you know, Coinbase, for instance, giving their driver's license numbers in prior episodes, not driver's license numbers, but actual pictures of their driver's licenses to attached to accounts. And here we're talking about traditional brick and mortar banks, which also have um, the same type right. of evidence for law enforcement. Right. And just, I mean, I think it does tie to my original point, which was, you know, the laws are just more mature. Um, And frankly, the sentencings to the violations of those laws are also more mature. I suspect that as crypto and as, you know, cyber crimes become more commonplace and um, more entrenched in society, the consequences for those crimes will start matching the actual impact that they can cause. And that's an important point. Yep. And with that, we have wrapped up this episode. So next, I'm going to take you out with our social media information. And I just want to invite you back for episode six. I'm sorry, episode seven, which we're going to talk about some more swatting in episode seven. So we look forward to seeing you on episode seven and we thank you for sticking us out in episode six. We'll see you then. Thanks. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. Thanks for listening. If you'd like to reach us, you can get to all our social media accounts through our website, which is ecrimebytes.com E-C-R-I-M-E-B-Y as in yellow T-E-S dot com You can get to all our um, social media accounts. You can get to our podcasting app. So there's over a dozen podcasting apps there. You can click on and find your favorite one. And you can even get our email address at the bottom of that page as well. And something you can do, if you like this podcast, please do subscribe on your favorite podcasting app. And if you like this episode or like the series, please leave us a positive review, especially at places like Apple Podcasts. That helps us um, move up in the searches so people will find our podcast amongst all the true kind podcasts out there. So with that, I look forward to seeing you on the next episode. Thanks. Bye. Sorry, I'm upset. That's some domestic bullshit right there. <laughs> I apologize. That, I'll fill you in later. I might have to clip that out just just for our opening someday. That's some <laughs> domestic bullshit right there. Your All right, wife will, your wife will love that. <laughs>